So you maybe hear this story that I'm going to read to you for the first time. Maybe you've heard it uh, lots of times. Uh, regardless, we need to hear it for a fresh time. So let's pray. Ask God for that kind of brilliant clarity. Jesus, you have this track record with, uh, with can I say it this way, with tongues, with lips. You know, there's times when you've struck people silent and uh, taken away their capacity to speak. And they kind of had in their minds a, a waiting for when you would release their tongue and allow them to speak. You, there's also great stories about you filling people's mouths with your spirit. Holy Spirit, you come and you speak tongues that they themselves didn't understand, but the people around them did, and that was the whole point. You, I mean, way back in the very beginning, the way the creation story describes it is, is you, living God, spoke creation into existence, and God said, and God said, and God said. And so we, we're praying for that to happen right here, right now. We're going to read your word, and then we're hoping that, you know, through my failing lips, you might actually speak life-giving words uh, into our own hearts and change us, even radically change us. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who's been born? It's the king of the Jews. We saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. Oh, and King Herod heard this. He was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. They said, in Bethlehem, in Judea. Well, that's what the, the prophet was written. It was Micah the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, Go, search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. Those of you who don't know the story should just know that he intends to kill him. After they'd heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When he saw the star, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down, worshipped him. And they opened their treasures, and they presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So we've been looking at these stories about who got invited to the first Christmas, kind of like a no-name carpenter, a little peasant girl who's probably not old enough to have her driver's license, and now these dudes, stargazers, the magi or magi, I don't know how to say it, the wise men, you know, we three kings. That's, uh, that's this story. There are female scholars who agree with the fact that it was, in fact, wise men, uh, men at least, um, because they arrived late. Right? They were a uh, full year after Jesus was born, probably got lost, too proud to ask for directions. A wise women, wise women would have been there on time, right? And uh, they would have brought more practical gifts, and they would have made meals for the Holy Family, and definitely would have been way more help in the labor and delivery process. Anyway, whatever. The point of this story is actually that foreigners were invited to Jesus' birth. Foreigners. They were called Gentiles. It's a not Jew. And they weren't just foreigners. They were astrologers. They were magicians. They potions. And these were completely taboo for Jewish people and, and for Christians as well. We don't do this stuff, right? And yet God drew these people in. And they came looking for the king of the Jews. It's a big deal. It's a big deal because they themselves weren't Jews. And if we're really, really honest, particularly back in this day, non-Jews were kind of icky. For Jews. Jews didn't invite non-Jews into their homes. They didn't eat meals with a non-Jew. They, they actually didn't want to bump into them in the marketplace. It's like, no, don't, don't do that. And then what happens is there's a, there's a knock on the door like that, and it's like non-Jews, and they want to come into the house, and they want to get really close to the Jewish baby. 
And it's blowing everybody's mind. It may not have blown your mind, but it blew everybody's mind here. This wasn't their baby. They're outsiders. This is not their king. They're outsiders, and yet it looks like God is doing something to bring the outsiders in. On the other side, the insiders seem a little bit miffed. Right? Verse 3 is kind of weird. When King Herod and all of Jerusalem with him heard this, they were disturbed. Herod was disturbed. Everybody loves a baby. What's this guy's problem? Well, because he's a smart man. Not everybody likes a king. Because kings have plans. Right? Herod was, you may or may not have known this, the self-named king of the Jews. This is what he wanted to be, king of the Jews. It was all his plan, and he had done things to try to win the Jewish hearts over to him. He'd done massive building campaigns. Those of you who've been to Israel will know this one, this one that I'll describe as he showed up in Jerusalem, he saw their temple, it was kind of pathetic, and he kind of tore it down and built this temple mount, like a big old platform, 37 acres, all of what you can see from, from this spot, if we were outside, on our property, in the church property, we 37 acres, and he built this thing up 10 meters high, It's huge. It's higher than anything else in Jerusalem. And then he put their temple on the top. He thought he would win their hearts in their favor, but it didn't work. They knew he was just a Roman puppet. He was a a maniac. He was a narcissistic, neurotic king. Killed his wife, killed his sons, right? And he wasn't even a Jew. He was actually from the line of Esau. He was an Edomite, so there's bad blood. Anyway, he's disturbed. Here's another word for disturbed. He's threatened. He's threatened. Fear and anger, right? Threat, anxious. So the wise men knocked at Herod's door, expecting that the new king of the Jews would be born in the house of the current king of the Jews. But that wasn't the case. No baby here. And Herod was exposed as the imposter that that he was, right? And uh, he's... Threatened. And all of Jerusalem with him, which is particularly curious, right? Because these are the people who've been waiting for this Messiah figure to come, for this king of Jews to, to show up. There's been promises for hundreds of years. The prophet Isaiah, actually, if you, I think it's 62, he talked about kings who would come who would bring gold and incense. <laughs> it's kind of like fulfilled, wouldn't you say? The Psalms talk, talked about kings who would come to honor the real king. This is what was in their book. It was all there, and they were waiting for it. But on this particular day, they were, they were disturbed. Why? Why? And the question is actually important because it happens in our day too. Why are people disturbed by the king of the Jews, by this Jesus? Let me take, let me take a stab at explaining why. Because they liked the way things were. We like it this way. They didn't like Herod. But they liked not liking Herod. Do you know what I mean? Like, they kind of figured a, ge- a groove out with him. And they'd squawked long enough and squawked loud enough that they'd, they'd gotten their way on a bunch of different things. And they had some respect. And, and the bed was kind of comfortable now. And everything's predictable, and it's kind of in front of us and familiar. So so don't go upsetting the apple cart. Everybody loves baby. Not everybody likes a king, because kings demand change. Kings change things. Here we are, the Jews who are not excited about the new king of the Jews, right? And, and, And that happens. I mean, people get all stoked about the baby at Christmas, but I don't know if we always understand it. There's a king involved in this story. It's... It's a king. I do, I do funerals as part of my job. That won't be a surprise to you. And it's an honor. It's a privilege to sit with people. They're grieving, and I get to ask them a couple questions. I said, just tell me a little bit about your loved one. And they have these great stories. They're always rich. They laugh, tell these stories. They cry. It's like a sacred moment to be with a family in grief. It's powerful, powerful. Because I'm a Christian, because I believe in Jesus, I'll say to them, okay, so I'm, uh, I'm a God guy. And I'm going to talk about God at your loved one's funeral. So why don't, you don't have to tell me what you think I want to hear, but why don't you tell me what you think about God, about life, about death, about life after life. And, and I, just, I just listen, just listen to what they have. I had a guy once say, and this would be typical, it's kind of a summary statement, a guy who said this to me. We believe that good people go to good places. Good people go to good places, i.e., we don't believe God exists, but we've been good. And if heaven exists, then we deserve it. 
there's this message, right? God owes us. God owes me. We deserve good things. And that's, that's quite frankly, if you look at the religions of the world, that's what, the way the religion works, right? I did my part. God now owes me. I've been good. Remember that time I went to church? Remember that time I prayed? Remember that time I gave a chunk of change to that, that uh, beggar guy? I did my part. Now God needs to return the favor. And you don't actually have to be religious to have religion thinking because people will say to me, look, we didn't kill anybody. We didn't rob a bank. We paid all our speeding tickets, right? God owes us. As, watch this. As though God sets the bar exactly where you set the bar, Right? God, by definition, defies this option. God of my making. My God. My version of God. Your version of God. You know what God's were? They do whatever they want. They set the bar wherever they want. That's the way kings work. Kings don't like take you know, instruction from us. Here's the way a king works. And Herod knows that about kings. And Herod wants him dead. So the insiders want the baby dead, and the foreigners, watch this, they want to worship. So these dudes aren't just Gentiles, outsiders, but they're worshiping Gentiles. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshiped him. Worship. Worship is when your body and your mind and your soul come in the presence of someone, the one who's greater, far greater than you, and you can almost hardly restrain yourself. You want to fall on your face like these wise men do, bow down or stand up and shout, raise your hands in the air, or, or you're at a loss for words. That's what worship is. And you know it's worship. You know you're feeling worship when you want to bring your very best, whatever it is. I've got my, I'm going to find my best and give it to this one who deserves my worship, whatever it is, my time, my energy, my money. Herod and Jerusalem are now worshiping. They're at least not worshiping Jesus. They're worshiping what the world worships. And when you worship what the world worships, hear me now. When you worship what the world worships, you will feel threatened. You will feel anxious. You will be fearful. You will be angry. That's the way it works. Jesus, who is the king, has this capacity, just by bumping into him, to reveal what it is that you worship. Herod was worshiping himself. The religious people, this is kind of nuance, so follow me. The religious people were worshiping their system. I like it this way. And the reputation that this gives me and the position that this gives me. So you're like, okay, dude, really peachy. I can come to church and still be confused. And I'm like, yes, you can. You can come to church and still be confused. So how do I know if I'm worshiping the genuine article? I think it's this clear. I think it's this clear. Do you live your life largely with a feeling of threat or with a feeling and state of joy. What is it in your life that has the predominant script? I'm not saying that if you trust Jesus, you only ever always feel joy, and I'm not saying that if you're worshiping the wrong thing, you're only ever always fearful, but I'm saying that there is a tone in your life, and it's either joy or threat. So what's the overall tone in your life? You afraid? Or is there joy? Third point, let me try to unpack that statement. Third point, these weren't just Gentiles. They weren't just worshiping Gentiles. These were expensive, gift-bringing, worshiping Gentiles. Right? Look at this story. They brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. And you, if you just do a little bit of homework on those three gifts, these were king gifts. These were gifts fit for a king, if not for God. That's what, that's what you'll discover. Gold and frankincense and myrrh. Right? These are the best they could find. Just saying, they didn't shop at Walmart. No. This is not an afterthought. This is not a re-gift. Hey, can we scrounge up something here? That's not what is going on here. They went looking for the best they could find to bring this, these gifts to the king of the Jews. Whether or not they knew or not, it was the king of kings. That's the kind of gifts they were bringing. The very best. So here's a question for you. Maybe you don't feel like you relate to this, but if you do, do you want to leave your threatened life do you want to be done with being fearful and angry and anxious predominantly? Do you want to find real joy in the God who loves you, right? If so, follow the wise men. So i got to tell you what that means. But before I do that, I think, men, you know where your wallet is on your being? Just tuck that in a little bit deeper, that wallet. Just tuck it in deeper. Men, women, if you've got a purse, just hold on to it a little bit tight because I'm going for it here, all right? I'm going for it, right? Wish me luck. 
Somebody say it. We don't believe in luck anyway. Here's, here's the question. Does Jesus get your best? That's the Christmas question. Does Jesus get your best? How are you using the money that he has given on loan to you for your short life here? How is that playing out? Here's a, who's getting the most expensive Christmas gift from you this Christmas? That might be a way of sort of unpacking what it is that matters most to you in your life. Let's just go for it. I'm in this deep already. I'm deep, right? Where does your money go for the other 12 months of the year? How is Jesus considered that? How is your king considered in how you use your money? Nice Christmas sermon, right? That's what you're about to say. Aren't you saying that? Nice Christmas sermon, Andrew. We want Lenita back, right? <laughs> Lenita tells us how much God loves us. And here you are. You're like reaching for our wallets and our purses. God loves you, and he tells you this stuff because he loves you. In the early scriptures, this is some backup, just in case you're like, man, these church people only ever talk about money. It's your first time here ever. And they're like, he's already after my wallet. So just so you know. The, in the early scriptures, the Christians, or not the Christians, the believers in, in God, of the living God, they were commanded to bring 10%, everything they had. They had 10 sheep, you know, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you are going, bah, you're going to God. And there's 10 goats. I don't even know what goats, what, what are the noise they make? Man, no, I don't, anyway, 10 goats and one, yeah, I think that's a sheep. Anyway, you know, this belongs to God. And the reason for that was so that they didn't find themselves worshiping their wealth, so that they understood all of this belongs to God, but I'm just going to make sure that one in 10, at least one in 10 goes to the God who gave this to me, gave me earning capacity, gave me opposable thumbs, thumbs gave, me, gave me IQ. I'm just going to make sure that my worship includes this gift of money, 10%. Sometimes they gave way more, but this was the low watermark, 10%. Christians in the New Testament did the same thing, 10%, and then some. They got a little carried away, actually. They had properties. I've seen this happen here. They had properties, and they sold them, and they gave all the money to what God was doing. They couldn't throw money fast enough at what God was doing through the church. It was fantastic. They had a blast doing it. Here's the thing. Surrender your life to the king, and joy is the byproduct in the exact same way that anger is the byproduct of a life that li is lived threatened. Hmm, 10%. Anybody feeling threatened yet? Yeah, okay, you're making eye contact with me, which is great. I've talked with a bunch of you, and I know 10% is, is not where you're at. So we love each other, we're working this out, trying to figure out how to do this best, and you're like, how do I even get started? And sometimes you get ministers who say, listen, start with 1%, start with 3%, work your way up to 5%, maybe that's a thing, but really I think the first step in all of this is this question, why am I not doing that? Which is the same question as what am I actually worshiping? What has first place in my life because that's where my money is going first? That's the way it works. I know, I know some of you are high school students. You, you make a minimum wage. You get 10 hours in your shift once a week, right? Give your best to Jesus now. Learn it. Yeah, I know you're saving for college or university. Maybe you're like, dude, my credit cards are maxed, or, or I'm saving for a house, or my kids play expensive sports, or I have, to, I have to max up my RSP each year, and it just means there's a little bit left over for Jesus. Do you, under, do you understand that in the context of the Christmas story, right? Because it'll sound like reasonable excuses to us, but to God, they're a worship fail. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's a worship fail. Do you now see how a king shows up and wants to change everything? At least nod your heads to that. Yes, yeah, you do. Now you're feeling the Christmas crunch, right? This is a king we're dealing with, not just, not just a baby. This, this king shows up and thinks he's in charge and can command all of what you've got. Herod, Herod took his gold and his frankincense and his myrrh, you know what he did with it? He put it under his own tree with his name on it. This is for Herod, right? That's for me. The wise men took their gold and frankincense and myrrh and they gave it to the one who deserves it, who's worth it. That's what worship is. It's worth -ship, right? He is worth it. So when you unpack this whole thing, there's actually only one real king in the whole story. There's only one real wise man in the whole story, and it's, well, it's the kid in the diapers at this point. It's Jesus, who's God. He's the wise one who traveled from afar to bring us expensive, what will prove to be very expensive gifts of forgiveness and joy and salvation. He's the real king who rescues us from false kings, who rescues us from worthless worship. 
Anybody up for radical life change this Christmas? Anybody? Follow the wise men. Bow to the king. So I, I, I don't know. Some people must think that, that Jesus as king is kind of like an unnecessary option. Let's just have the baby. We, we don't really need the king. You know, kind of like, um, you know, have you heard those phone calls for duct cleaning? <laughs> yeah, right? And they're like, man, you have no idea what's lurking in your ducts. And you're like, well, I've seen the pictures. I'm going to put up with miniature Godzilla and King Kong in my ducts, but no thanks. Click, unnecessary. That's not Jesus. Jesus as king isn't a, an option for you. Jesus as king is actually more like a rescue helicopter hovering over you, lowering your rope while you drown in the North Atlantic to say, here's where life is, climb out. That's, that's the way Jesus is. Because what you worship, who you worship, is a matter of life and death. It's Herod and his types who are threatened and tight-fisted, and they're exposed as imposters. Their hearts aren't nearly as good as they imagined them to be. They hate the king for exposing it. So here's the Christmas question. Where's your, where's your gold going this Christmas? Where's your, where's your frankincense going to go this Christmas? Where's your myrrh going? Right? It's the wise men and wise women who want to bring their best to the one who is the best. Okay, I'm still going for it. Jesus actually isn't scraping for 10% from you. He's scraping for 100, right? Because that's what kings deserve. These wise men, they worship with all of their heart and all of their soul and all of their mind and body. Their, their money just points to where their heart is. That's what money does. It doesn't make sense, but you get life by giving your life to him. I might just say this because I started the conversation. On the matter of your money, start asking Jesus to help you. Just that. Jesus, would you help me know where to start? Can we, can we do this in baby steps? You want to give to God everything that belongs to him. You want to give him what's worthy of him who is your king of kings. Do you think this is going to mean a change in your life? Do you think this might mean a change in your spending? A hundred percent. But I should just tell you, this is only the start because he's going to want to talk to you about your relationships next and your emotions and about forgiveness and about all other good things in your life too, right? Your worship changes, your life changes. That's that's the king, and that's what the king wants for you. I got thinking this week about a conversation in Babylon, 1 AD. 1 AD, the king's observatory, and there's just several guys that are doing some research together, and they've got their whatever's out, pencils together, and they're drawing graphs and looking at stars, and they all agree The signs point to it. A king has been born. And here's the question. I want to know which one of the wise men says, you want to go? How about a road trip? Right? Let's find the best gifts we can. It's it's 750 miles. If you you were flying a plane there, it's 1,700 miles. That's a walking distance between Toronto and Regina, Saskatchewan. We're going to pack our best. People are going to think we're nuts. I've already packed my stuff. What do you say? Right? And I think he's smiling the whole time he's talking. Joy. Joy. Let's go for it. Let's do this. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you didn't come so we could feel sentimental. Thank you that you didn't come and we just feel all gushy and mushy. You came to change our lives, to be king, to be sovereign, to take charge of our lives and help us to know how to live our lives best. We think we know it. We think we got it. We think our money is best in our hands at our discretion. And yet you show up and say, hey, let me tell you about all of your life, all of your life that I love, all of your life that I want to pour meaning and purpose and joy into. And so here you are, right at your very birth. It's already starting. The ripple has started. The tsunami is hitting the shore. This is a king who demands our best, who deserves our best, and uh, who has given us his best. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, please stand. Please rise. Here's God's blessing, his very best. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day, tomorrow, forever. Amen. Amen.